Great. Um, so this is the first webinar I've ever given, so this is a little strange to be talking to my uh, screen here without seeing anyone else, but the upside of that is you can't see me that I'm here in my pajamas either, So because it's about 8 in the morning here on the West Coast. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the work we've been doing here on the West Coast, um, particularly with uh, larval oysters and uh, shell formation, and there's a lot of people that have contributed to this work, and you see their names listed here. I'm not going to run through all those, and this work's been supported in large part by the National Science Foundation uh, and Oregon Sea Grant and the National Fisheries Conservation Center. And so we're going to talk about today is, um, after a little bit of background, really uh, what you're seeing here are these SEM images of uh, larval Pacific oysters that from about 10 to 16 hours post-fertilization. And there's a lot that happens in this time frame, but what you can see are these uh, beginnings of the initial shell here. This, this sort of wrinkled area here on the bottom left is really the outer organic layer of the shell called the periostrogum. And over about a six-hour window, <clears throat> that shell is essentially there's no mineral there to what we see a mineralized shell. And you can see we caught a really nice intermediate one here where you can still see some of the um, sort of loose periostrogum here and then the calcium carbonate being kind of pushed in there and, and that becoming taut and ultimately becoming the shell here on the right. <clears throat> so uh, just a brief outline of what I'm going to try to cover today in, in 40 minutes, uh, maybe a few minutes more, is uh, just a one slide on what, what ocean acidification is, a little bit about the coastal zone and acidification, then um, a little bit of background on bivalves and then start to talk about Natural failures out here in the sea crisis, and then getting into both observational work we've done in the oyster hatchery uh, in Neatarts Bay, the Whiskey Creek hatchery, and then some preliminary experimental data that we're drafting up right now for a manuscript, and then putting all that back into some environmental relevance. So um, this is a little sort of summary of what I call ocean acidification chemistry key points. Um, and there's kind of six points I want to make that if you keep these in mind, it's really critical for thinking about ocean acidification in the coastal zone. And this should be old hat to most of you, but as you know, increasing CO2 in the atmosphere increases carbonic acid through this um, condensed reaction here on the, uh, in the first point. That increasing carbonic acid results in hydration of carbonate ions, and so what that does is lowers the number quantity and concentration of carbonate ions and generates bicarbonate ions. And in the coastal, in marine waters, pH is largely driven by the ratio of this carbonic acid to the carbonate ion. Um, there are obviously other um, acid-base species that come into play here, but the, the BIC system is the primary one. So that ratio of carbonic acid to the carbonate ion is really critical for determining pH. And then the saturation state is driven by the total concentration of carbonate ions. And so it's a really important distinction, especially when we start getting into different uh, water masses and estuaries, is that it's the total carbonate ion concentration that drives saturation state, whereas it's the ratio of carbonic acid to carbonate ions that drives in large part the pH. And as I noted earlier, the acid, other acid-base reactions alter pH and the carbonate ion concentration. And then really importantly in the coastal zone is that alkalinity is generally but not completely proportional to salinity, and there are some deviations from that. And this is probably the most visually unpleasing slide of the talk, so I'll get that out of the way here, and we'll get into looking at some, uh, some more visually appealing data. So uh, just what is ocean acidification? This is a graph of the carbon emissions and, and uh, millions of megatons per year. Uh, this is from the CDAC website. And basically what you'll see is that um, the burning of fossil fuels increases, and per year we're continuing to increase the emissions of CO2 in the atmosphere. About 30% of that carbon we release in the atmosphere ends up in the ocean um, through the formation of carbonic acid, which I noted earlier, and then again, which results in dissociation and production of protons here, which is what lowers the pH, and then some of those protons are titrated by carbonate ions, which lead to this um, increase in bicarbonate ion concentration. So I, I think one of the, the, the um, best sort of recaps or, or kind of encompassing views of this is this paper that um, Babel Harnish published in 2012. And this is from a global um, Earth system model where they looked at 
doubling times of atmospheric CO2 and its effect on ocean chemistry. And so in the top panel here, um, what you're looking at is the atmospheric CO2, and these different colors correspond to different doubling times. And so the key is uh, down here on the right, the legend. And so the numbers, the, the graphs, the lines in red, are a doubling time of PCO2 in about 10 years, and down to blue is about 10,000 years. And so what you'll notice is that the pH of the ocean in all cases change. It doesn't change nearly as much if we double CO2 in the atmosphere much more slowly. But what's even more interesting is that, that um, the saturation state of surface water <clears throat> in some cases barely goes down, especially at these really slow emission scenarios. And so this is all encompassed in this bottom chart here in the D panel that shows the mean surface pH on the x-axis and the aragonite saturation state. And again, what you'll see is that if you increase CO2 rapidly in the atmosphere, it takes a long time for the weathering processes on the continents to catch up <clears throat> and stabilize that and move um, the aragonite saturation state and surface waters back up again. But if you double CO2 much more slowly, you don't have nearly um, as much a change in saturation state and a lower, less of a degree of change uh, in pH. So in the coastal zone, uh, there's a number of other factors that come into play in terms of driving the carbonate chemistry. Um, and so in the top uh, figure here on the, the cartoon is a, is a uh, picture from Kelly et al. paper. It was a science policy paper I worked on. And basically just summarizing kind of the major inputs into the coastal zone and, how, and, and just that these will affect the carbonate chemistry. And so some key points here, again, is really there's two ways to change the chemistry in coastal zones. It's either in the balance of the acid-base species, which is similar the same as adding CO2 or other um, strong or weak acids or bases to the water mass, or by changing the alkalinity, which again is proportional frequently to salinity. Um, <clears throat> importantly, I showed you previously in the geologic record that the carbonate systems can decouple. And so pH and saturation state can change differently from one another uh, than we often think of when we think about just what's happening now and the increase in CO2. And in the coastal system, because of these changes in salinity and these other processes, you can get this decoupling between saturation state, pH, and PCO2. They're all still related, though. Um, importantly, in terms of what this means for organisms is that we know that the variability doesn't uh, mean a priori that organisms can tolerate additional acidification stress. Um, they may be, some may be more well adapted to additional stress, but we know from plenty of excellent thermal studies um, on intertidal organisms that, in fact, sometimes organisms are just closer to their thresholds, and so that's one of the big things we're trying to figure out now. <clears throat> and, and a lot of the work I've been doing with the group here at OSU is really looking at the timing and sensitivity of life history stages. Uh, with good and bad times, and that's likely to be a critical determinant how populations ultimately succeed. And so another way to sort of envision this, this is um, Joe had mentioned uh, working with him earlier on a, on a paper. This was a, one of the graphs we put together for that. So this is a time series of uh, PCO2 in Neatarts Bay, and this is on the uh, Oregon coast just south of Tillamook Bay, and you'll see the PCO2 in blue here, and the red is uh, sea surface temperature. And so from January through to uh, August, you'll notice there's a lot of variability in that system. Uh, it wavers around 400. And then as we get into the upwelling window, you start to see increases in CO2 that often are quite variable and uh, will drop from day to night. But the mean of those tend to sort of increase quite a bit. So one of the things we did, uh, Joe and I did, the help of uh, one of my grad students was just look at a frequency analysis of that variability in a few different systems. And so we took Neatarts Bay data from summer and spring, and then some uh, data that Joe had from Piscataua. I said that right, River Inlet. And so this is just a fast Fourier transform of those data sets. And I've cut off the low end of this because it wasn't long enough to include that. And so basically what you're seeing here is the amplitude of PCO2 variability and peaks that we're showing here on 24-hour, 12-hour, 8-hour, and 6-hour cycles. And so the point here is that there is this variability that's there and that as we increase atmospheric CO2, it's likely to either shift the timing of some of these or the magnitude of these, these, um, these amplitudes at these different frequencies. Okay, so um, this is, gives maybe a better picture of where we are. This is the, 
Pacific Northwest Coast here with um, Washington State, Oregon, and Northern California. And this is some work uh, my colleague Brooke Hales was involved with, um, and this is a paper in GRL from this past year. And what they did is took a number of observations from the contemporary, which are uh, in these, these white bars here at the NH10 line. This is a Newport hydrologic line uh, 10 miles offshore. And then they calculated the, what the chemistry of the aragonite saturation state would have been without the additional CO2 that we put into the atmosphere. And what you'll notice is that there's a shift, uh, both in the sort of median here um, of about just, just about uh, half a unit in saturation state. And there's also more values that are showing up at undersaturated uh, seawater in this below one here at this value. Another view of this is uh, some of the work that Claudine Hari has been doing on the <coughs> coastal biogeochemical circulation model of the carbonate system here. And so this is just uh, some model output. And this is showing um, from the model run beginning in 2005 the um, change over time over the next several, dec over the next several um, decades. And the yellow bars here indicate the pre-industrial range of where saturation state would be in these waters. These blue bars indicate where we are kind of currently, so the sort of min and max. And what you'll notice is that as we progress forward here in, in only about 10 to 20 years, the, the maximum highest aragonite saturation states will be below what we see currently. Um, and so all this points to that we're sort of in this, uh, what, what we often call an ocean acidification hotspot because we're in this system that has a lot of productivity to begin with. And we're increasing this baseline, which is shifting that uh, much more rapidly than the global baseline in terms of carbonate chemistry. So to shift gears a little bit here and talk about the organisms that we've really been focused on or I've been focused on with my group, um, this, is essentially, this is just a schematic of a generic oyster life cycle. And so um, not all uh, oysters are broadcast spawners, but we're going to talk mostly about the Pacific oyster, which is. And so they broadcast egg and sperm into the uh, into the overlying water, there's external fertilization, and from this period to this uh, swimming dehinge villager um, is where we're going to really focus today. So I, I like to think of that there's probably about three really important bottlenecks <clears throat> in terms of ocean acidification effects on bivalves. One of those is here at the embryogenesis, and so going from that fertilization to the formation of that first shell. The second is during metamorphosis. Um, in which they're transitioning from the larval to the juvenile stages, which involves um, a reorganization of the body plan and then uh, cementing themselves to some suitable habitat. And the third is really the, the, um, there being suitable ha habitat for them in terms of shell and shell material in those environments. <clears throat> so I just want to give you a couple examples from some work that um, I really got started with working on Mar with Mark Green on this uh, in, in Clams, and so we really focused on um, this metamorphosis and what happens after or as these um, larvae, these bivalve larvae, transition to the sediment uh, water interface and where they ultimately uh, live. And so um, these are data that I compiled from from one paper I worked on with Mark and Mark's previous work on this. And what you're looking at here is a, a mortality rate at three different saturation states for aragonite, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 1.4. And then uh, shell size here from 0.2 microns. And so these are basically pedivellagers that haven't yet fully metamorphosed all the way out to kind of, these start to look like essentially very small clams uh, and what you'll see. And what you'll notice is that for all the treatments that mortality is generally higher, even in the supersaturated conditions at this small size, um, but it's quite a bit higher at these lower saturation states. And then as the organisms get larger, that mortality rate, the difference between essentially a, a good chemistry and not so good chemistry for the organisms really decreases. And so there's a lot happening in this stage, um, in, this, in this life history stage in that transition. <clears throat> so um, then this is some work uh, looking at calcification rates in post-larval clams. And uh, so what I have here is the aragonite saturation state plotted on the x-axis. Again, above one is supersaturated, and below one uh, is thermodynamically unfavorable for shell formation. And then the calcification rate is just a, a weight per day per live weight of organism. And um, what you'll see here is the, the 
adults. The um, largest organisms are in uh, white and the smallest ones are in black. And these are actually in shell lice here. And what you'll see is that um, as they get larger, they calcify more quickly uh, on a per weight basis. And they can even calcify in undersaturated conditions. But they're generally more sensitive at these um, smaller sizes. And these differences in the squares and circles, I should point out, are just different, uh, actually different subspecies of hard clam. And there was another uh, aspect of that work in terms of thinking about hybridized organisms. And so again, the larger size calcify, and, and really importantly, at around this size here, about one millimeter, they start to de they develop the important organs. Um, both the siphon, the uh, inhalant siphon begins to close so they can more readily capture food. And the mantle folds, which is really where a lot of the calcification action happens, are, are more fully formed. Okay, so we're going to switch over and really start focusing on the Pacific oyster larvae now. And again, I just wanted to give you the perspective of the metamorphosis, is that uh, thinking about these critical life history stages, when the organisms go through periods they can't feed, uh, is really critical because they have limited energy and there's a big reorganization of body plan. Okay, so <clears throat> calcification uh, requires energy and it's biologically mediated. And so the, most of the oceans and most of the time in our coastal waters, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, saturation states above one. So it's favorable, it's thermodynamically favorable for calcification or the formation of calcium carbonate. But the rate at which this happens naturally is very, very small relative to what rates um, biocalcifiers do. And so there's really two primary ways that organisms overcome this this hurdle, <clears throat> one is either they pump protons, and this is just a model from McConaughey and Gilkin, um, and so they have a calcifying fluid that sits between their tissue and the shell formation surface, and they're basically pumping protons out of there to make it more favorable uh, for calcification, also dealing with the fact that as they're calcifying, that, that space is becoming uh, less thermodynamically favorable, so there has to be some replenishment of, of building blocks, basically. <clears throat> the other way is that they use a uh, Within this shell, there's an organic matrix, and this is a, a decalcified larval muscle shell um, showing uh, protein stains in here. And there's a series of proteins that are involved in the coordination and this, essentially the scaffolding of, of where the bricks in terms of the calcium carbonate go. And so both of these things require energy to do, and this is what really allows these organisms to calcify at rates that are much faster than what would normally happen. So. I'm going to come back to this. I'm just telling you that this is a bit of foreshadowing for the story we're getting to. Okay, so um, here I'm going to show you some pictures. These are scanning electron micrographs that um, my grad student Elizabeth Bruner, who just recently finished her master's degree here, um, took. And these are um, images throughout the early life. Uh, and so at three hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, 24, and as they get larger until finally um, for the aquaculture industry here, what they sell or seed, which is usually 14 to 21 days. And so again, as I pointed out earlier, you'll see that it's a very rapid transition uh, when, from when they build, get this first part of the shell formed here. This is essentially you're looking at the hinge on the back of the shell to when that shell is actually calcified at a dehinge. And the, these timings will really vary depending on cohorts and conditions. Um, um, but ultimately, by 24 to 48 hours, typically, Oysters have formed this initial shell, and we call it the D hinge because it has a straight edge back here. And you can see that actually at this point, this um, sample here is, has what we call the protosiconch two stage shell. This area here, which is formed in that first period of time, is called the protosiconch one. And that shell, as in all bivalves, is preserved over time, and all the new shells deposited um, inside of that. And so what we're really going to focus on for the rest of the talk is what's happening in this first 48-hour period when that first shell material is precipitated. <clears throat> and this is really critical because as this organism grows, they cannot uh, really start swimming or feeding until they get the shell finished so they can attach the velum, which is the swimming and feeding organ. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the Pacific Northwest Sea Crisis has been a real problem for the industry out here. Um, there's been a lot of news coverage of this, and so that has led to the um, formation of the Washington State Blue Ribbon Panel, Governor's Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Certification, and, um, and there's been a lot of uh, murmur within the industry, including some one oyster grower 
uh, starts hatchery in Hawaii, and so moving the operation out to Hawaii to get away from the waters that are here. Um, <clears throat> the estimates are it's cost the industry about $110 million in, in sales, and the hatcheries have taken a number of adaptive steps, and in large part um, because of the work Burke Hales did with with Alan Barton at the hatchery in installing <clears throat> uh, monitoring equipment there, which allowed the hatchery to essentially work around the bad water. And we've since uh, continued to work with them. And now uh, at least two of the hatcheries out here are buffering their water. And one of the really kind of interesting aspects of that is that for a long time, the Taylor's hatchery had noted that they hadn't seen any problems with growing gooey duck larvae even when they were having problems with the oyster larvae. And now that they've started buffering all their water for culture, the gooey ducks are coming out with stronger shells and they're getting better survival on their outplants. And so it was a, um, actually they've increased some gooey duck production uh, in a way that they hadn't appreciated that um, there might have been a problem there with the chemistry before. So um, this is, I'm going to walk you through the, um, the graph from the Barton and Al paper. And so this was the data that Alan was collecting and working with Burke and we've put together to try to figure out what was actually happening. And so I'm going to show you a number of graphs here. Um, what's on the x-axis for all of these is the aragonite saturation state in the initial water. And so that's the water that the, that the larvae are grown in for the first 48 hours of life. And then there's a number of graphs here uh, starting from the upper left, I'm calling initial survival, which will be the sort of first metric, and then early growth, mid growth, and total production. The initial survival is just um, a measure of how many, the proportion of how many eggs respond make it to that dehin stage. The early and mid growth are, you'll see these numbers are reversed on the axes and we're calling that days. And this is basically just a benchmark for how long it takes the larvae to get to a certain sieve size that they're big enough. And then finally the total production is essentially the change in culture tanks over the ent entire cohort production cycle. And so what you'll see is that this initial survival of the dehinge here uh, there's a slight trend, but it's non-significant. There's a non-significant correlation here, or not? There's not a correlation, but you can see a slight trend. So as um, the saturation state increases, they tend to be better. And again, you'll notice that almost all the conditions are in supersaturated waters. You see, there's really no um, trend with in early growth, and so uh, how long it takes them to get to that first benchmark following the fertilization um, really shows no impact from the water they respond in. In mid-growth, we start to see significant uh, relationship between the spawn water <coughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and mid-growth. And so the, the, the mid-stage, which is now getting into about 7 to 14 days, um, you see some changes in, in how quickly they're growing. And then finally, the total production and really the production in the hatchery, see a very strong correlation between what happens in that first 48 hours and how many larvae are coming out of the hatchery. And so um, what this indicates is that about over 50% of the hatchery production is explained only by what's happening in this first 48 hours in terms of saturation state. And again, what's curious about this, and you should ask yourself, is why there are no, um, why we're seeing this strong of a trend in the first 48 hours when all these conditions are super saturated. So all these all these waters are thermodynamically favorable for calcium carbonate production. Um, so um, just to show you some more evidence for a, a saturation state threshold that's above one, this is some uh, data that my other grad student, Maria Jimenez, uh, pulled together from a few different papers. Um, and there are several other studies we could use, um, but unfortunately a lot of that was incomparable for multiple reasons. But this is actually growth here. So this is shell length. And what you're looking at are uh, 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 nonlinear regressions uh, for different hours post-fertilization. So blue is 48, red is 72, green is 96, and this uh, teal color is 144 hours. And this relationship between the experimental conditions and size uh, weakens as they get larger. And so really the strongest effect is in the first 48 hours. We see the small effect, 72 hours. Um, uh, and then this decreases over time. And again, this is a this is a really acute impact we're talking about here, and not the chronic effect as I noted before in the Barton paper. Um, and uh, basically, to compile these, we had to put these through a physiological model to, to standardize things like temperature and salinity to do this, um, which was not simple. Okay, so uh, moving on to 
um, observational study we did at the Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery in Utarts Bay. And so this is really the uh, master's thesis work of Elizabeth Brunner. Um, and so essentially what we did is we tracked three different cohorts of larvae through the hatchery at each tank change, taking the sort of mantra that every tank change is a bioassay. And we looked at the larvae, um, both the soft parts and the shell. We looked at the water chemistry, and we, and we looked at the dye in as well. And so each of these cohorts had about 400 million larvae. Um, and this, we, we followed two cohorts in, uh, in August and one in May of 2011. And the great thing about doing something like this in the hatchery is that the carbonate conditions are set by Neetarts Bay, but the temperature is controlled and food availability are controlled. And so these are optimized for production in the hatchery. And the only thing that was varying at this, in this study was really the carbonate chemistry. <clears throat> and then um, we sampled a number of things, as I noted. We looked at larval <coughs> biochemistry, and so um, C to N ratios, some very crude measures of lipid content, and then stable isotopes. Um, and these are basically being measured every two to three days at each tank change when the larvae are sieved out of the tank and the water is re refilled. So um, the, the highlights of this, uh, and Elizabeth has a paper in prep that will be hopefully getting submitted soon. Um, is, is that basically, I'll, I'll walk you through this here. This is the DEL-13 scene, so this is essentially a, a tracer of different sources of carbon. And what I have here, it's all to a standard. And what I have plotted here is the, the DEL-13C in the water, and so the dissolved inorganic carbon, and in, in the blue lines here, and in the black is the, what's being incorporated into the shell. And so we'll just focus on this top part first. And what you'll notice here is that in the shell, the values are, are more enriched than DEL-13C. And what that indicates is that more of the shell is being formed using seawater DIC versus metabolic carbon. And I'll explain that in a minute. If you precipitate aragonite directly out of um, seawater without any biological intervention, you usually get a fractionation of about plus 2.7. And so we can actually use these numbers and estimate how much uh, metabolic carbon, uh, CO2 that's being exhaled essentially by the organism is going into the shell, and how much um, seawater DIC goes into the shell. And so it varies from it, this point, it's about 14 to 15 percent, or I'm um, sorry, it's about seven, 6 to 7 percent uh, metabolic carbon at uh, day two, and this is in the May cohort, and then uh, it decreases, or the metabolic carbon increases to about 14 percent by the end of that cohort. And we know that the metabolic carbon is lighter. It typically reflects our food. And so just to come over here on the right, I'll show you this graph again I showed you earlier. So the respiration across tissue surfaces results in CO2 moving into these calcifying fluids. And this is quickly equilibrating through the DIC system in seawater. And so that's where that metabolic carbon signal comes from. Uh, what you'll notice here is that I have the tissue plotted in this uh, mustard green color. And then the algae fluid that's being fed to them every day is plotted in the green. And so they start out about minus 20. Um, and we have some other data that I, I don't have plotted here, but shows that the eggs are typically about minus 20. And the food is about minus 40. And the reason the algae is so um, depleted in Del 13 c is because these are um, um, cultures that are actually being bubbled with industrial CO2 to increase production. Um, and so there's a change in the food as these organisms uh, grow, and that's the reason the food also jumps up here in culture technique. But basically what happens is, is the, um, you'll notice the eggs here are minus 20, and so at day two, there's almost no incorporation of external food into their tissue, and then that changes over time, and then they more quickly reflect the food. And then you'll see there's some wobble and variability around here, but that's just because different species of algae are being used in different culture techniques. We also have um, uh, del 15N or nitrogen. And the, the main point here is there's a difference between the carbon and nitrogen, and the nitrogen signal um, is, is changing less quickly and, um, to reflect the food. And that's basically, we believe, because they're burning through carbon-rich uh, molecules such as lipids and holding on to things like proteins uh, for growth. And so basically what all this, to summarize all this, is essentially 
in this early stage, they seem to have less ability to control the calcifying fluid. They're more exposed to the ambient seawater chemistry and uh, thus incorporating more of the DIC into the shell. And it takes them a few days until they actually um, get to the point where they're actually uh, really sort of reflecting their food. And so by day two, when they've already formed that first shell, they essentially have not uh, incorporated any external food into the um, shell. And basically, they can't feed until the Gehan shell is made. And I'm going to show you on the next slide that they hit energetic load about five to seven days. And um, I've often wondered if this is potentially what is behind some of the lazy lar larvae syndrome, which um, many of the hatcheries note in terms of larvae just sort of not swimming anymore. And so um, here are data from the three different cohorts. And this is uh, <clears throat> days since fertilization on the x-axis here and lipids and nanograms per larvae on the y. And this is just in a natural log scale. <clears throat> and what you'll notice is that in, uh, in all cohorts that there's a low about five days or so. And then this rebounds and comes back up again as they're preparing for metamorphosis. And so basically the egg size or how, many, how, many, how much lipid they have is set, sets the larval lunch back and what they're starting with. And so, um, this is critical for giving them the energy for forming that initial shell, but it also says that, that the physiology during that initial shell formation is essentially um, limited by the energy that they have from the eggs. So I noted before that the, um, the shell formation is very rapid, so um, these are some estimates of calcification rate, and these are based on uh, estimates from zero to two, one or two days uh, here for the May. We had sampled the larvae at day one in August and day two here in May. That's why that's, this difference is here. Um, but in fact, the calcification rate during this initial shell formation from uh, showing on the right here is probably at least double that rate and potentially four times as high. Um, and what you'll notice is it's very rapid initially for this initial shell formation and then it sort of slows down to a more stable lower rate down here. And again, this is just in per day, so it's, it's standardized per mass. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about why that's not a great way to do this, but we don't have good measures of surface area, which is what we really ultimately want to know. Um, and so the key here is that in that first window of time, before they form the shell, they're completely organic. And by two days, their 80 to 90 percent body weight uh, is calcium carbonate, and the rest is organic. So it's it, per individual larvae, it's an incredible amount of calcium carbonate that they're precipitating in very short order. And so, what we've done is basically look at a standard kinetic equation. And so this is uh, the equation here is simply describing the rate of shell rate of calcium carbonate precipitation as a function of a rate constant, and that's um, uh, a function also of the saturation state and a rate order. And we're going to assume for now to keep the math easy that the rate order is one. And so essentially what I've done is take these calcification rates for 0.6 and where we're down at this lower calcification rate about 0.04 and calculate what the rate constant would need to be to support that calcification rate as a function of saturation state. And so what you'll see is that when we're up about three, there's not much difference. As we start approaching two, the rate constant that's needed to support the, calc the higher calcification rates really start to separate from the slower calcification rate. And as we start approaching undersaturation, this rate constant increases, uh, essentially the rate constant that you need increases exponentially. And obviously we know that this is a simplification of the system because many organisms can calcify in undersaturated conditions, but it gives us an idea of a constraint on the biocalcification process. So um, here's that rate constant again. And so uh, as I noted earlier, calcification is biologically mediated, requires energy. And so there's really two ways to do that, as I noted before. One is, is to change or modify the saturation state, and that will uh, help increase the calcification rate. And what we're, what we're um, positing right now is that the organic matrix is actually what's changing this, um, this rate constant. And the rate constant is really supposed to have terms of per area. And the issue is that we don't really have, at the moment, good um, estimates of true surface area of these calcification surfaces, which is something we're kind of working on. So we think that the, um, this organic matrix 
is really critical in driving that process because it's providing these nucleation sites and potentially changes in the composition, the biocomposition of that organic matrix might change the surface area, which then would lower this rate constant. And we know from some of the energetic calculations that the protein synthesis is really the primary energetic expense uh, for calcification. So this, the cost of running these proton pumps are relatively cheap compared to the cost of synthesizing protein, and particularly at this early stage in life when they have uh, a set amount of energy that they can depend on. Um, and just to show you, so we're kind of working on this a bit. So this is some uh, data from uh, an RU student or a SEM image from an RU student I had in the lab still working with us now. Um, and this is a, the edge of an of a oyster shell, uh, Pacific oyster larval shell, uh, at about seven days that we've decalcified. So we've removed most of the initial the calcium carbonate that was present and then uh, left the organic material there and then reprecipitated mineral on top of that. And what you'll notice here is that in the background you see these calcium carbonate needles here and then the precipitation that's forming on the shell uh, without the biology present at all, this is just a dead shell, is quite different. And so this is kind of just a sneak preview of some things we're working on right now and trying to understand the role of this organic matrix and how it changes uh, just based on the physical properties. Um, the type of mineral and, and how that mineral is precipitating. Okay, so I'm going to trans uh, get to the experimental evidence here. I think uh, I'm not doing too bad on time. Um, and so these are actually some um, experiments we've run out at the Hatfield Marine Science Center to evaluate what parameter of the carbonate chemistry system is really relevant. And this is going to, as you'll see, provide more support for the importance of saturation state and I think supporting our hypothesis of a kinetic control at this early stage in larval life uh, and, and for saturation state. Okay, so um, the whole goal was, in, uh, was to basically run a bunch of bioassays to let the larvae tell us what they don't like. And the way we did that was manipulate the dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity to create unique chemistry conditions. And I'll show you those in a minute. I'll show you data for development and growth. And so we're looking at the, how many larvae develop normal to 48 hours and how big they are, how big the normal larvae are. In the experiments we ran, we had 16 chemistry treatments uh, with three replicates each and several different controls. And then for each replicate, we had triplicate counts for development. Um, to just look at counting errors, and then uh, we measured shell length uh, of all the normal larvae. So we didn't measure any larvae that were, were deemed abnormal. And then we ran this experiment twice, and so we did this on two separate groups of uh, oyster larvae. And again, this is only, these are only acute effects, and so these experiments are only running for 48 hours um, just in that first stage, and so we're not getting to the point where they're actually feeding yet. So to give you a sense of what the chemistry looks like in our experiments, uh, this is a, probably the second least visually pleasing slide that I'll present today. Um, and so we have 16 treatments here. We have, this is, we just put this into a matrix here, which uh, one of the grad students working on this project, Matt Gray, has termed uh, a suite of treatments, otherwise known as a sweetments. And what you'll see is that uh, Going across from left to right, you have decreasing saturation state, and from top to bottom is increasing PCO2. And then uh, each of these boxes is a treatment with the chemistry of PCO2, saturation state, pH and seawater scale, DIC, and a total alkalinity. And so to give you a sense without going through the whole table how things kind of vary, we can go down um, uh, within a saturation state, and you'll see there's some change in saturation state um, here. And so, but it's more or less similar, um, but we increase the uh, PCO2. And so we can have super saturated conditions with very high PCO2, or we can have um, low PCO2 and under saturated conditions. And so you can see here that as we go from left to right, saturation state decreases and we've kept the PCO2 relatively constant. And so the the study is orthogonal with respect to PCO2 and aragonite. And unfortunately, without <coughs> doing a three-way factorial, which would increase the number of um, <coughs> replicates and, and experimental units, we don't have orthogonality with pH, although we do have some tests of this, and one of which is on the diagonals, pH is, is more or less um, 
similar. And so you see there's some, again, some variability here, um, but they're pretty much the same. And so we have very few treatments with very high pH and very few treatments with very low pH. But we have a number of uh, treatments sort of in, towards the middle range that um, vary both with PCO2 and saturation state. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few graphs here. So this is the percent normal data, and this is uh, we're looking at these not with SEM but with regular light microscopy, um, and we're evaluating the shell shape uh, to look for the good sort of dehen shape. And so I have the experiments. Uh, experiment one is, is plotted with the circles, and experiment two um, in the squares. And I, what I've done is just condense um, the the BOD bottle treat, uh, replicates, so the true replicates with standard uh, deviations here. And so what you'll see here is PCO2 on the x-axis, and we can get uh, basically no, no, different, no significant difference from controls at 3,000 microatmospheres of CO2. We can get larvae to develop normally. Or we can get larvae that don't develop very well at all um, relative to our controls, which is around 80%, at these lower PCO2 values. If we look at pH and you twist your head a little bit, you can start to think maybe there's a little bit of a trend there. You see even at a pH of 7.8, there's still quite a bit of range in response, and I'll address this in a minute. But then if we plot the percent normal versus saturation state, you'll see um, a very strong relationship that um, soon before you reach under saturation, um, this starts to curve um, and decrease. And so as we get approached and go uh, undersaturated with respect to uh, aragonite, you see a sharp decrease in the percent normal developed. Um, to come back and address the pH um, here, what I've done is just simply plot, and these are not plotting the means of standard deviation. These are each replicate, uh, uh, treat, uh, replicate within a treatment for the three, the four different um, omega categories we have: low, medium, low, high, and high omega versus pH. And again, because the, we're not orthogonal with pH, we don't have the full range for all of these, but we have a fairly good overlap amongst the, um, amongst the treatment structure. And so what you'll see is there's a, there's looks like a bit of a, a relationship at the very lowest omega. And so these are typically in the area of about 0.5 with respect to saturation state for aragonite. Um, but once we get close, closer, undersaturated, but closer to one, and then at these higher values, you see almost no uh, there's really no effect of pH on um, uh, um, on pr proportion normal developed, and so you know, it looks like at these really low pHs maybe there's some impact. Um, but if saturation state is okay, then um, then there's really no effect of pH, and then the the majority of the effect is in fact driven by saturation state and not pH. So. Um, now I'm going to show you shell length of the normal larvae, and so again we're excluding the abnormal larvae here, and so this is shell length in uh, micrometers as a function of aragonite saturation state, and the darker shading equals the higher PCO2 treatments, and so what you'll see is a fairly strong relationship, and it's not a very big difference in size, and there's a bit of variability within the treatments, and there tends to be a slight, uh, what you typically see is, is slightly higher than the uh, um, predicted values uh, for size with higher PCO2 and slightly lower with lower PCO2. Um, I should point out this blue um, uh, square here was, um, <clears throat> I should point out two things. First is that we only did this, the sizes on one of the two experiments is it's very tedious. Um, for many of these we're counting per replicate 100 to 200 larvae. And so Kale Miller, who's an undergrad working in the lab, I think we've estimated he's counted about in size. He's at least counted uh, on the order of 20,000 larvae at this point. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here was the blue um, square down here was a treatment we ran to check. Um, what if we just simply added calcium to change the saturation state? So we took water that we manipulated that was around here for this treatment of, of a saturation state around two and doubled the calcium concentration. And the larvae didn't like it. And we saw even worse performance in the percent normal. Uh, as well, and there's a number of reasons that cal too much calcium is not good for larvae. Um, I'm not going to get into that. So what we see here, basically, though, what I come back to is that it looks like a slight positive. You might be able to interpret a slight positive effect of PCO2 on size, and it's very small. And so 
the problem is our DIC is correlated to PCO2 our treatments more or less um, because of the way we're doing the manipulations. And so what I did here is plot the DIC concentration versus uh, shell length for different saturation states. And what you'll notice is that everything except the low omega value, we see a positive effect of DIC on, um, on size. <clears throat> and that's not really um, actually too surprising because there's a number of uh, really good papers that have been done looking at the DIC effect on coral calcification. And so there seems to be a secondary effect of DIC on calcification, um, particularly when conditions are more saturated or, or better in terms of the saturation state. Okay, so why omega? To, to recap the experiments. So uh, what we're seeing is that as we uh, proposed in terms of a kinetic um, reason for the sensitivity of the early larvae that omega appears to be the main driver of development and size in the first 48 hours. For development, there's plenty of good evidence for pH effects in other species and stages. Um, and so this doesn't mean that what we're trying to say is that uh, these other components of the carbonate system don't matter. But for these organisms, when they're building the shell at this really fast rate and they need to do that so that they can have their exoskeleton and attach their organs for feeding and swimming, that omega seems to be driving this response, the dominant uh, uh, parameter. And only under the most undersaturated conditions does pH seem to be important. And again, that's slightly confounded with the fact that we don't have orthogonality with pH in our experimental design. For the growth, uh, there's plenty of good studies on corals that indicate the importance of DIC for calcification. Um, and we see a small secondary effect of DIC on growth, uh, but again, there's a, some confounding between DIC and omega in the experiments. But bringing that back around and providing some perspective on this is that almost all studies are confounding, um, are confounding carbonate system variables. And so what we're really trying to do is separate these and understand how the different variables impact different components of the organismal physiology. And so as I said before, the strong demand for shell precipitation during, the for, during formation of the Proteus Conch 1 shell appears to drive the sensitivity and this doesn't mean that these other variables aren't important in other life history stages. And I don't have the data shown here, but we have some recent uh, respiration data that shows that changes, um, we see some changes in larval respiration at only the lowest pH and does not seem to be affected at all by saturation state. So the upside of this is that <clears throat> there's a small window of opportunity in the hatchery, you know, and in in Alan's work um, compiling those data really shows that, that there's a small window of opportunity that um, if you can get the conditions good, you get yourself pretty far along the way. Um, the downside of these omega thresholds, uh, or the, the fact there's a sensitivity to omega and it's above under saturation, uh, is that we're going to cross some of these sooner, particularly in coastal zones. And so just to wrap up, I want to just give you a little bit of environmental relevance. And so what I did here is just simply take some values, plug them into CO2 calc, um, and I have the, the sort of parameters I use up here, salinity 28, 15 degrees C, and an alkalinity of about 2100 micromolar, and so kind of coastal waters, and then plotted how pH changes uh, with, sat or how aragonite saturation state changes with pH as we go from a PCO2 of 200 microatmospheres out here up to 1600. And so what you should note here is at 400, we're just under saturation state of 2, and if we increase to about 700, we get to about 1.25, and we're still not at these really low pHs where we really see some of these uh, effects manifest, at least on the larvae here. Um, and so again, it speaks to this idea of these windows of opportunity in the first 48 hours being so critical for these larvae, in large part, we believe, because of this demand for shell material. Um, so um, to give you a couple other examples here, this is just um, some, this is again the relative larval production from the Barton paper, and so the saturation state in the initial water, and this is the zero break-even point, which you know, if you ask Alan or Sue or Mark, this is not really good for them, but we're just using that as a sort of standard to say, at this point the biomass is less than what you start with, and at this point it's more than what you start with, and that shows up at about a saturation state of 1.7 here. Um, this is just showing Neetarts Bay, and this is the approximate location of the hatchery. And so they're really getting the full brunt of the ocean water here, uh, particularly during upwelling periods. And this is a, um, 
data, the PCO2 time series from the hatchery in 2010. And so the black line is a running daily average, and the PCO2 is, um, is uh, one minute, one minute um, data uh, frequency. And what you'll notice here is if we look at a roughly, uh, if we approximate what the saturation state would have to be, it's sort of typical alkalinities for a given PCO2, it's about 550 or so. Um, and so the problem is if we add CO2 to the system in a very, in a very unsophisticated way, and we just shift up the baseline, you'll see that um, as we increase the CO2 amount by about another 150 microatmospheres, there are many times that the daily average is actually falling um, well below the um, saturation state threshold. And again, it should, just to sort of orient you, if we're going down here, the saturation state's increasing, so it's inverse of the PCO2. If we go back to the sort of regional scale, and we take that 1.7 or even 2, if you like, wherever you want to draw that threshold, what you'll notice is that we get more and more conditions that are showing up at under saturation and particularly below this level here. Um, and I noted before that, that um, where, that, where that saturation state was on that, on that graph. So, um, so basically, as we've increased the baseline, we're seeing more uh, conditions that seem to be crossing important thresholds for these organisms. Um, this is a modeling study again, so 280 and 400, and this is approximately where 550 would be. So if we, if we move that up to about 550, you'll see we'll get to that point in the next you know, 20 years or so. And then finally, looking at the global baseline shift, uh, these are roughly estimated omegas for Oregon's coastal waters based on PCO2 levels, and uh, again, these are really rough estimates um, because there are changes in temperature that are significant from summer to winter, um, and also some smaller changes in alkalinity. But if we look at where the baseline would leave us, um, so our pre-industrial would put us about 2.7, where we are now is about 2.2, and that's roughly what um, is in the Harris paper. And then if we get to 550, that puts us about this 1.7 point, um, which is all sort of coincidental with what uh, we sort of noted in the Barton paper. So just to uh, wrap up here, um, so saturated state appears to be of the primary importance to developing larvae due to this high demand for calcium carbonate precipitation, and we're arguing that it's the kinetics, not the thermodynamics that are important. So it's the rate at which the organism needs to build that shell versus the, how easy it is to build that shell. Um, and this doesn't preclude the importance of other variables, and we know from lots of great studies that other people have done that um, some of these organisms lack the ability to regulate internal pH very well, and so, uh, so, so these are certainly going to come into play and create stressors on these organisms. But in terms of why we see this effect before conditions are undersaturated, it's because in this first 48 hours and really in the first 10 to 16 to 20 hours, there's this incredible demand for shell material through development. Um, so we've, we've actually done these experiments uh, with multiple other species before, and so uh, two different mussel species and repeating one of those experiments twice, we've seen the same patterns, um, very similar response curves. Um, and so we do have one species we've tested now. We're going to go back and check that again and stay tuned for those results. Um, hopefully by the end of the year we'll have those out. Um, it's important to note that the experimental studies I'm showing are acute, <coughs> are really acute effects. and so. Um, those thresholds that we're showing there at about undersaturation don't account for the longer sort of chronic thresholds that you do see in the size uh, data. And so even with the normal larvae that do develop, they're, they're, they're smaller, um, and some of those um, size effects have been more pronounced than some of the other species we've looked at. <clears throat> However, we're, we're in the process of building a system that we can run these sorts of manipulations for the entire larval life history to better evaluate um, both the importance in that first 48 hours and also whether, um, say, pH stress that may elevate respiration rates might be a more significant uh, impact when you, when you integrate that over the entire larval life history. And so in these coastal zones that we're thinking about in upwelling areas, estuaries, where you have lots of other drivers of carbonate chemistry, these system parameters decouple. And I really believe that understanding this in relation to the sensitivity of species and life history stages is really crucial if we really want to get to a point of predicting winners and losers. Uh, because a lot of these organisms are found in these variable environments, and so we have to be 
realistic in how we do those experiments and understand those responses. Um, and again, given the small window of sensitivity in Pacific oysters, and again, not to say that later stages aren't sensitive, they're just not as sensitive. Uh, we need to understand the timing of these life history stages and ultimately how the carbonate chemistry variability will change with increasing CO2 and climate, um, both directly with the chemistry, but then also as regional climatologies change and shift things like uh, timing and intensity of upwelling. So with that, um, I just need to, again, acknowledge funding agencies and a number of people that have helped uh, make this work possible, which is a lot of hard work by the students, um, many of which I noted in the uh, presentation. Um, and I guess I'll just take questions now if anyone's still there. 